Okay. All right. So are we all, I guess. Good evening, everyone. It's 5 o'clock, and I call to order this workshop of the Victoria City Council. Our workshops are informal, so we'll dive right into the agenda. There is just one item on our workshop agenda this evening, which is our 2024 preliminary budget. This is the first look at the budget for 2024 and the first of several budget discussions that will be held between now and December when the council will officially adopt the budget. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our assistant city manager, Tricia Pollack, who will kick us off this evening. Ms. Pollack, please. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Welcome to budget season. It's so exciting. <laughs> so <For you. laughs> this evening, we will start out um, going over a budget um, preparation overview. Um, we'll look at the preliminary property tax projections, uh, the 2024 preliminary budget. We're also going to update on the American Rescue Plan funds, and then we'll have some time for discussion. So this will be the first time you and the public are going to be seeing budget numbers for 2024, and this by no means is set in stone. It's a starting point for our budget discussions, which will be held regularly <clears throat> over the next six months. While you're not voting on a budget today, we'll be looking for direction and feedback. So when we come back to you in August to discuss our max tax levy, we're on a path that reflects your goals for the community and the budget. So our budget calendar includes five public workshops before the final adoption. In addition to this evening's agenda, we'll be hearing from our department heads in August who will give overviews of their departments and what their budget pressures are for the upcoming 2024 year. At that same meeting, I'll present an updated 2024 budget based off of your feedback from this evening for our max tax levy. Then in September, we will adopt the max tax levy. In November, we begin the budget <coughs> presentation for the Victoria Recreation Center and our enterprise funds, which include water, sewer, and stormwater. We'll also take a look at that, our five-year capital improvement plan and a final general fund budget presentation before we adopt the budget in December. So how does a city budget? We use both an incremental and a priority-based approach to budgeting. So the incremental approach means that we start with current services and base those prior year expenditures off a three-year average. There can be some other indicators that may change those projections depending on inflation and pricing changes that we might already have received um, from the, some of our vendors. Department heads review all projections line by line and also will add in new requests or remove items which are all reviewed by the city manager before they're included in this preliminary budget. So the priority driven approach determines how effectively a program or service achieves the goals and objectives that are of greatest value to the community. These items are determined by council through your strategic plan. Another budget consideration is the projected year-end fund balance. So our fund balance policy requires us to have at least 30% of the subsequent year's operating expenditures in the fund balance. This is due to the timing of when we receive our tax revenues, which don't come until mid-June of the tax year. Other considerations include the long-term financial plan, and we are looking 10 plus years out to project future debt and make sure that we are seeing within our state and self-imposed limits. We get preliminary numbers from the county in June. So these numbers can and will change before we get to the max tax levy budget. So we've not received any fiscal disparities numbers for 2024 from the state or county either. So we're projecting that at this point to just stay the same. So for the public's benefit, fiscal disparities has mandatory participation and is set by state statute. It's a revenue sharing program that applies to cities in the Twin Cities metro area and on the Iron Range. It's meant to support a regional approach to development, equalize distribution of fiscal resources, and reduce competition for commercial and industrial development. So why does your tax bill change? 
from year to year, your property taxes may go up or down. Why does it fluctuate? Minnesota property tax formulas are some of the most complex in the United States. That being said, there's a number of factors that cause your property tax bill to change each year. So just because you may have a slight increase or decrease in your city portion of the tax bill, your levies of the county and the school district and other taxing jurisdictions also will affect your tax bill, ultimately determining whether your overall taxes increase or decrease. Who spends the tax money? When you receive your tax bill from the county each year, it's inclusive of all taxing jurisdictions in the county. The city's property taxes comp comprise only a portion, which is about a third of the total tax bill. As you can see here, for each dollar, the city's portion of the tax bill is about 32 cents. Other taxing jurisdictions also make up your property tax bill, including the county at about 34 cents, schools at 32 cents, and other taxing jurisdictions like Mosquito Control, the Met Council, and the Watershed District. Those smaller districts are about two cents of the dollar. Referendums can affect this too, so we wanna point out that even for the same valued home, your taxes might not be the same, depending on what school district you're in, Victoria has three school districts, Eastern Carver County School District, Waconia School District, and Minnetonka Public School District. The final 2023 tax levy amounts um, are listed here. So this would be for this current year and how we compare to our market cities. So um, we've ado adopted those market cities from which we compare ourselves each year. And you can see here, Victoria um, is in the middle of the pack at about 7.37 million, with the other market cities kind of ranging between that 3.85 up to 16.8 million. An increase or decrease to individual property tax bill will largely depend on individual changes to your property's value. For 2024, preliminary estimates we received from Carver County indicate that the median home value in Victoria will increase 2.3% up to $559,700. Last year, it had increased 11.4%, so um, quite a bit less of a jump this year than it was um, between 22 and 23. Trish, what was that percentage again? Can you repeat 2. that? 2.3%. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So our focus is on the budget in the city levy because this is what the city can control. The county assessor assigns these values to homes and the state legislature sets property tax rates. So what's changing for 2024? Well. What, like we just discussed, the median home value increased 2.3%, um, which was a much less of an increase from the pre previous year. The construction value increased. We're budgeting that we will have 130 new home permits in 2024. This number reflects a five-year average, but also is considering trends and new plots. In 22, we came in under budgeted number at 135. So we were nine homes under budget last year. Um, and we're budgeting 144 homes for 2023. So far, we have 82 new homes. So we're on a pretty good track for this year to hit the 144. But just with the unknowns in the housing market, um, we feel more comfortable with the 130 homes for 2024. Victoria is a growing city, so with new home and commercial construction, an important question is how much of the increase of the levy is offset by new tax base. We can estimate about how much new construction will provide in property tax for next year. So about 74 million of new construction value will come online 
to provide approximately $219,000 of new taxes. This leaves about 697,000 of the total tax levy increase to be spread among the other property owners that exist last this past year. Victoria's tax base. So we are largely residential. There currently isn't a significant or we're largely residential. There isn't a significant uh, commercial and industrial tax base. Um, but this chart, you can see that the residential values that combined total market of all the properties in Victoria for existing and new construction continues to increase at 5.8%. So the new construction was 3.1% increase and the um, market value increase of 26 um, commercial actually saw a pretty um, large increase in comparison with the value increasing 12.3% and 0% for new construction as we didn't have any new construction for 2023. Apartments increased about 5.3% and again there was no new apartments um, in the prior year. Now we'll take a look at what's in the preliminary budget. So this chart shows that the revenues projected for 2024 compared to 2023. On the bottom there, you'll see the taxes and franchise fees are the largest source of revenue for the city and make up more than 85% of the total revenue of $8.2 million. Licenses and permits include business and non-business licenses, including liquor licenses and building permits. And again, this reflects that um, a reduction for 2024, which is due to that lowering to from a 144 to 130 homes that I um, had just previously talked about. Um, and same with the charges for services, because the charges for services includes um, permit review, plan review fees. Um, that charges for services also includes cell company antenna leases, um, planning and development fees, and um, other revenues include fines and investment earnings. The overall budgeted expenditures is increasing by 14%. Half of that increase is due to the larger increase in transfers, which we are going to go through um, individually in a few more slides. Um, but the park and rec is increasing mainly due to park maintenance and also um, we have, which we'll go through some other details too about where, where some of the main increases are, but there's a master planning um, for parks included in that increase. Um, and also the programs have expanded significantly since um, COVID and so there's more expenditures for um, running those programs. Public Works is increasing mostly due to snow plowing and fuel costs. Public safety is increasing mostly due to the sheriff's contract. Um, there's a pretty large increase that we'll be talking about. And general government is only seeing a slight increase, but partially because um, we have an election in 2024, which we don't in 20, 2023. And the levy change. So what does that all mean? Um, with the revenues and the expenditures. Um, so right now we're looking at a 12.59% levy change between um, 2023 and 2024. So the levy is the city's operating budget. It reflects how much we need to operate the city, provide services like the police, fire, street maintenance, snow plowing, parks, etc., and increase 
of 12.59% doesn't mean that people's taxes will increase 12.59%, but only calculates the difference in the amount that we need for 2024 versus the amount that we need for 2023. And what does a 12.59% increase in the city's levy mean for property tax bill? So I have listed here property taxes for the median valued home at $559,700 and also a home at $300,000. So an increase of that 12.59% um, gives the estimated tax rate a 2.36% increase from which was 27.37% um, for 2023. So a large part of that is because of the lower um, increase in market values this year. You're gonna see that tax rate fluctuate because of those um, market values staying, um, staying closer to the same as prior year. So an annual increase from 2023 would be $133 a year for a medium valued home and $71 a year for a $300,000 home. Okay, hang on a second, Trish. Yep. I, wanna, I wanna understand this a little better. So estimated pay 2024 city annual taxes, $74 per month on the $300,000 home mm -hmm. is what we're expecting. Last year, that same home paid $71, or is that? No, it's an, an increase. increase. Yeah. So this, it's almost gonna double the city taxes on this $300,000 home. Am I understanding that correctly? No, um, so that, that $71 is an annual, and the 74 okay. is per month. So that $71 is added to the 892. That's correct, Got yes. It. Okay. Yep. It's already in there. So it would have been $71 less, less the prior yeah. year. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So here is um, how that monthly charge is spread out between city service functions. So um, if you think about some of your other bills that you might have as a homeowner, your cell phone, internet, cable, electric, or gas bill, um, you need to consider, for example, Public Works, $18. Um, is that a good value to have for your streets to be in good condition and plowed um, or trails that connect you to other places? And $33 um, to ensure that your community is safe and someone is going to respond when you call 911. Um, this is just a different way of thinking about your property taxes and what services and value you get from paying your property taxes. And again, that's on the medium valued home, the 138. So let's talk about budget pressures and what we've included in the preliminary budget. So just thinking back to that expenditure slide that I showed and um, where some of those increases are year over year from 23 to 24. Um, the first item would be personnel. So we're not budgeting for any new um, uh, full-time employees um, for 2024, but we are factoring in a 7% increase for benefits. So that would include um, like your health care. Um, we don't get those numbers until like October. So unfortunately it's always after max tax so that's one of those things that can go up or down so we try to use kind of an average and also we talk to um our benefits provide consultant who tries to give you um kind of an idea of what she's what they're seeing out for changes even just in the um private field so for 2024, also, we're recommending a 3.5% COLA. Last year, this was 3%. And then up to a 2.5% merit on an employee's anniversary date. Last year, that was 3%. So in both scenarios, it comes out to the 6%. It's just that the 3.5% would be at the beginning of the year 
and the two and a half percent would be depending on the employee's start date. Now, this number doesn't include a market adjustment at all um, for any of the positions, and we do have a compensation policy that indicates that we pay middle of the market. So we're currently conducting a market analysis and expect a couple of positions might need to be adjusted um, that we would be looking at for max tax. Um, the benefits, again, um, also reflect our projected costs based on um, the staff that we have now versus the staff that we had last year. So an increase year over year where we have more staff full time this year where there was some vacancies last year until those newer positions had been filled. So that does show kind of that, that change um, from year over year. Recurring operating expenditures. Um, so for the cost of doing business and everyday supplies for us to deliver our core services, they're all increasing. So um, I did include a 3% inflationary factor on most line items. Um, but with the rise in fuel costs, we had not been budgeting enough um, for fuel. So that is um, showing a significant increase of 66%. Um, we've increased the number of vehicles, mowers, we're doing more parks, we have more streets. Um, the snow plowing, those snow plows just cost a lot of money to run in the winter time and with all that snow that we had, um, it really drove up the cost of our fuel tremendously. Um, we're also experiencing um, increases for electricity and gas that we hadn't budgeted enough year over year um, between 23. So we're trying to make up for some of that for 24, hoping that um, we can get a, bit, a little bit closer to actuals. Um, so I put in a 7% overall um, increase for utilities. Um, so, and then the snow plowing. So that 20,000 increase has to do with um, depleting a lot of our reserves this past year because of all the snow that we had. So now we're trying to replenish some of those supplies um, for this year. But um, the snow season obviously runs, you know, two times in each year when you've got the end of like the fall so we'll see where we end up this fall yet for 23. But um, we're going to try and hopefully not have as much snow and be able to kind of carry over so we don't have to spend any more till 24. So we're increasing the budget for 24 so that then we can replenish those supplies that we've just really had to um, dwindle down. And also salt and the sand that we use has prices have, the de-icer has really increased. Um, so when you talk about those supplies, is that what you're talking about, the salt and the sand yeah. and, and those de-icer things? So usually we have a store of those yep. and we like to keep those on hand because snow is unpredictable. Yeah. And we've depleted that supply yeah. that you're talking about. Yeah, and so Dave has like, he's spent all of his budget for 23 and he's hoping that we don't get a lot of snow so that then we cannot have to purchase anymore until 24 so then we would have to really stock up because we're going to be like out so we're going to try to carry through what we can but we just don't know until we know when it snows so fingers crossed it's uh doesn't snow a lot till after january 1st so um, so yeah, snow removal hit us hard this past year, as you all know. And then the um, police services. So that, um, as has been mentioned and talked about, that we've been expecting an increase. And so we had, it was a 13% increase in our police service contract that this reflects. And a lot of that is because of the um, adjustment to the renegotiated labor contracts that Carver County had with their employees. So they were very um, 
underpaid compared to the market and they made those adjustments last year but it now it's catching up because our contract is up so now we're going to have to pay for what those increases were because um, there's kind of a one-year lag in that so now we'll be realizing that in 24 um and then also they had the same increases in fuel costs and um, similar to what we had so um they pass all of that on to us. Um, and then our composting, I'm increasing that due to the use of the compost site. So even though we apply and receive grants from the county for composting, um, we <coughs> continue to spend more um, than what we receive for that grant above and beyond. Um, in order to continue providing an unmanned compost site, which means that it's basically open whenever people want to drop stuff off, um, we're either going to have to secure down that area or increase this budget by the 10,000 and hope that we can cover costs. Um, contractors and residents from other cities have been using our site which increases the cost to our residents. So we're experiencing a real problem with dump trucks of contractors unloading their stuff so they don't have to pay to get rid of it. And yeah, I've, uh, I've seen. Which they're charging their clients to do anyway. Yeah, and they're charged, I'm sure they're charging people. So is, um, is that site? monitored with security cameras um, so we don't have internet out there so we have a camera but it's not as effective as what we could have if we had internet and we don't have fiber out there so um, we are talking about pulling the gates from Wasserman because we had those out there from when they were doing construction to close it off and bringing those gates back. Um, we've had gates up there before and people will go around the gates, but that would at least then shut it down at, you know, after working hours. So people would have to come during the day, um, which might help some, but. Um. Yeah, mm. this is this is kind of why we uh, had that monitored before. We had some yeah. folks who were monitoring that site to make sure that it was just residents and it was just compost, not construction materials and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. That's um, super unfortunate, and I think it's something we're going to have to have a conversation about dealing with because that's that's not fair to our residents to have to pay for construction dumping. No. So Trish, the cameras that we have, are they like trail cameras? I mean, they're like fake cameras. <clears throat> so, so we, we, let's discuss a few. And also it's like, even if you catch someone on a camera, say we have a trail camera, I mean, we have to have some way to enforce it. And then the alternative would be if we had it manned, they could check right. IDs and exactly so which yeah. also costs money because yeah. we'll have to hire staff and usually it's going to like what we used to do like we do like a couple events a year and then we'd have public works staff it and we'd have to pay them overtime some volunteers that were, yeah. yeah we had volunteers that one time but yeah. that, that's that's a little bit of a um, challenge to get but we did a couple of events a couple weekends mm -hmm. and we staffed it and you had to show proof of residency before you could bring your compost in and um, and that worked pretty well for a while until you know so we went along because it worked pretty well for a while people were respectful of well if they're doing it at night it doesn't change right like they're still going to do it when the so, people are there yeah, so but we like, need to secure the site yeah. or but but do we at what point does the the cost to do all that outweigh sure. the amount that we're paying extra for people to do what they're doing right like I don't know, right? I mean, you're it's paying pretty twenty thousand dollars to secure it, but you're only paying right. five to I do know. this additional stuff. It like, feels like it's a little contagious. Do we do we have signage that says video oh, yes. surveillance? And, Absolutely. Yeah. 
I mean, we have signs that say no contractors, Victoria residents only. I mean, I was telling Dana I saw in Carver Life because I live in Carver. There was a post about you can drop it off twenty four seven, and it pinned our compost site. <laughs> I almost died. I wrote, "That's for Victoria yeah. only." Okay, okay. <laughs> but I mean, it's things like that. Like yeah. people take advantage of it because it's free, and they don't want to haul it and pay. Some cities will charge like a dollar a bag or whatever, you know, and they'll have special events and they right. charge for people to drop stuff off. I mean, that's also, well, this is, you know, something to was, consider. Uh, this was a benefit that our city, uh, that our residents wanted. And it's, it's really unfortunate that um, it's being taken advantage of because that's going to create us. To, you know that's going to cause some pause for us to go is this something we want to continue to provide because we you know yeah one way or another we're paying right. more money well and you know fuel costs are going up 66 percent we can't control that we can control composting um to to a certain extent you know there's things that we can't control mm -hmm. and so when you start talking about budget pressures and and giving give and take and you know that's okay we don't need to solve the problem today, but it's it's a it's good to know. Yeah. Have we actually yeah. ever caught people? Like, I mean, like we obviously know people are dumping it, but are, have we actually caught people? And I mean, do we do we just basically say like you can't do that, or? Um. So we seen them from afar, sure. but not been able to like catch up to sure. them. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, and it's kind of obvious too. You can tell when just by some of the materials that's left that it's not a resident, like a homeowner that's just dropping off stuff, like, you know, there'll be like big rolls of sod, you know, multiple rolls of sod or something where you know that somebody had removed that, like a landscaper had removed it and then dropped it off to get rid of it. So I don't, it's just something that we wanted to at least mention because yeah. I only see it increasing year over year because it increased last year and now it's increasing from twenty to thirty thousand dollars this year. So for us to to get the compost. Yeah. So I mean, it's That's a significant a, yeah. increase year over year. Over year. Yeah, over. and you know the city has its own composting needs too. So like we like to be able to use that grant for like our own needs too um and we keep asking for more money and the county's you know been pretty generous but also we can't guarantee that they're going to give us more money for 2024 yet either because right. we haven't gotten to apply for that grant all right Okay. Dana has a question. Yeah, I just yeah, Ms. Party, please. Thank you, Mayor and Council and Trish. Um, I just wanted to also mention there's also been some dumping that's happening there, so we're getting more than just composting type of debris. And our public works team does spend time because the people who are taking that the the composting away for us are only taking the composting. So if other things are being dumped there. We have to spend our staff time separating out, and then there's a cost to us to dispose of that too. And so um, I just want to give a nod to our public works crew who are taking on the burden of that as well. Did we have a plan for, right, so a while back, there was interest in that building. Um, what did we, I can't remember? Did we have an idea of, okay, if some, if we got rid of that building, where would we move the, and I guess is the, Mm -hmm. Is there a more secure location that we could move it to? Do you want me to respond to that? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mayor, Council, um, we did talk about uh, kind of the long-term ultimate plan if Council were to keep the composting um, site open, that we could relocate that up to the uh, new Public Works building. Uh, but we're not ready to do that now. That would be when we expand um, in the long term. So we're still 8, 10, 15 years out um, based on just other decisions and things that are happening with the fire station move that's going to delay some of that. Um, 
there'll be a significant cost in just grading and doing some circulation uh, to make it safe for people. If people are coming to drop compost during the day and we want that open during the day, there's big machines and equipment that's going um, in and out of the public works when we're working during the day. So we wanna make sure that it's safe, um, that there we don't have stacking. Um, so we'll have to work on some circulation if we, when we do that, um, but that was gonna be uh, down the road. The only thing I would say is, um, is there any potential for uh, partnership with a private, right? Like if we decide it's not, you know, so like, I think, I wanna say it might be St. Bonnie, right? Like they have, there's someone, it's their property, right? But if you're a resident of St. Bonnie, like you can do it for cheap, right? Like I guess, if, is that an option too? So we've um, had, we, we've never had some conversations with St. Bonnie that I'm aware of. But well, I don't mean St. Bonnie, yeah, and, but, but I meant like, do we have a property owner here in Victoria that, you know, we have lots of farms, right? Sure, so like yeah, they're, we're not aware of anybody, um, but we've had to have, we've had some conversations with like the Shakopee Metaquonkinton Sioux community who's going to be um, opening kind of a yard waste facility kind of close to 169 and 41. Um, and there's, uh, they're willing to participate. It would cost us some money to do that. Um, some of the feedback when we were talking about this a couple years ago and bringing this composting site back um, and having those conversations, um, people didn't want to travel that far. Um, there's also a place not too far from here. Chaska. And, has yeah, and, and that was too far for people to go. So we were trying to find something that was closer. But if there's, if, anybody's out there listening and and has a property and would like to open that we'd certainly be happy to talk with someone yeah I know we also talked about the private trash haulers also do compost mm -hmm. so um, there was a point in time when that was the option that we were going to select just because people could get rid of their compost through their uh, trash hauler um, and then it proved to be such an important service for our residents that we brought it back and now we're sitting, it's like everything old is new again. We're back to the beginning on this thing. Yeah, and there are some HOAs, it's my understanding, that have included like the composting with the garbage mm -hmm. um, hauling. Um, obviously they pay extra in the summer months for those services, but some people just find that a convenient way to do it. And then there's some people that don't Really compost because they don't have mature trees yet you know so I mean it benefits many of the residents but I wouldn't say that it benefits all of the residents um, just because of the different needs that res different residents have. I started paying for compost services because we closed it the last time it was too much of a pain to switch back mm -hmm. so I mean and I've got mature trees very mature trees so it I this I mean Paying, I'm, right now I'm paying double, apparently, for services that I'm not using for the city. Um, and some of the older res older neighborhoods are doing the same. I, I, a 50% increase on services that are being taken advantage of need to be looked at and cut if it's not proving to be a service <clears throat> or a benefit to the taxpayers. Yeah, I think we should have a conversation. We'll, we don't want to get mired up in this composting conversation. <laughs> anymore tonight, but that's something we should probably have a conversation about because that that is it is not a new issue, friends. It's not. We've had it before. So, all right. Okay. So then we have a couple of items here that are listed under the non-recurring expenditures. Um, one of them being elections. Since year over year, we didn't have an election, in, or we're not having an election in twenty three, and we will have one in twenty four. Um, and it's also a presidential election year, so um, we'll have three elections to administer. Um, so this, of course, adds to the budget, and we anticipate a $33,000 increase um, in that election budget next year. And then one of the bigger drivers in the increase levy outside of the police services contract for 24 is our Parks Master Plan. So our last plan was conducted in 2003, 
and covered 2003 to 2023. So one of the things to think about um, this evening and we can circle back to discuss is whether you want to invest in another um, nine, you know, 15 or 20 year plan for parks. Um, currently the scope is large and includes parks, park amenities, open space, placemaking, and the recreation center. Um, later this summer we'll be conducting community engagement activities to start to gather feedback from the community about our parks and recreation amenities and services. And this feedback also might help inform, um, help us to make some of those budget decisions for the max tax and of course the final budget. So as you can see here, um, we currently have $100,000 in the 2024 um, budget for that master planning project. And just to give you kind of a idea $100,000 is about a 1.35% increase in the levy. So just to kind of give you a perspective. I, you have a thought on that? I, I, that master plan, I would, before we include that, I'd really want to get my arms around what we're hoping to accomplish through the, through a master plan. Um, you know, we got to pay for an election next year. We've got this park master plan um, you know there's not any urgency around that I feel like that's kind of a nice to have not a need to have and so I would I would really like to have a bigger conversation around what what we would be hoping to accomplish by spending the money to do a big master plan mm -hmm. and you know we are in transition with our park and rec with um, and retiring so um, probably want to take a look at that part of things as well. Council, any other thoughts on on that? Well, I'd argue that that I mean that's if we 20, 2003 to twenty twenty three is about five thousand dollars a year to have a park plan. If we did it for twenty years and it breaks out over that, um, right now I feel like parks are uncoordinated and, and disjointed. I, when I think of our parks, I think of plastic parks. I don't, I don't, it's it's a sheltered plastic play structure and something else. We have no central park. We have small neighborhood parks. We have the band, the the little park in downtown here, but we have no gem of a park. And so uh, nothing that is that is all encompassing with uh, amenities like Lake Ann or some of the other parks, Round Lake and Eden Prairie. Um, some of these are central parks to those communities. We don't have one. We don't have play fields other than maybe Lions Park a little bit. We haven't put a lot of thought making that our central park. So a master plan would be good for us, I think, in the long run to make sure that we have a plan to follow, that we're not just spitballing, well, let's put another park here. Well, what's in that park? It's like the park we were gonna try in my neighborhood. It was planned to be a plastic park. I said, why can't we just leave it as an open natural park with the trees that are there? And that, those are the things that we, if we haven't mastered one, then maybe we move on. But we can talk about it as we go in the budget process. Obviously, it doesn't need to be 100,000, but I think having a master plan for our park system as we're continuing to grow is going to be important for moving into the future. All right. Yeah, I think that warrants more. Conversation. Yeah, I like what you brought up about Lions Park and thinking of it in that from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be central. Mm -hmm. um, so I like that, I like bringing that into the fold of the master plan of however we go about right. that. And we'll also be right. We've got our south growth area, and that has potential. You know, with, when we were talking about Victoria Acres, right? Like mm -hmm. It was going to be that destination. It was going to be not just shooting range, but like park. Right? We have potential for other. Well, you know whether it's Victoria Acres or not, right? We have potential to do some big something, you know, that's going to draw people in there. Okay, good conversation. So, um, future budget pressures. So, um, we kind of want to recognize some movement that's happening on some of our pretty important streets in our community. Um, such as Highway 5, County, County Road 11, and 82nd Street. 
So our partners at Carver County and our state and federal legislatures have been great partners and advocates um, for helping us get some funds um, that we really need to make some improvements to these corridors. And now with outside funding falling into place, the city now needs to bring its share of funds um, to get these improvements going. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about a plan on the next slide um, that will help hopefully to um, fund some of our cost share of those projects. Um, but in addition to some of those um, future budget pressures um, other than the streets, um, we also just have our funding for future parks and trails um, as we grow, increasing the number of parks and trails, our long-term facility needs as we grow, and our future fire station and equipment, um, and the costs of um, being able to um, invest in our public safety. So, um, here we are with the um, plan transfers. And um, as you can see on the bottom there, the most significant change in plan transfers is for roads. Um, we have many projects coming up, which we were just mentioning, and not all of those expenditures are going to be bonded for. So we're still working on a plan for paying for some of those roads, and we do have some of that plan already in our long-term financial plan but we still need to consider the needs that we have for our existing roads, which are our overlays. And there are many of those that need to be done now that our roads are beginning to age. So this past year, we put into place a condition index, um, which measures the condition of the roads. So we're making data-driven decisions on our aging roads and not just relying on the age itself. So this will help make um, smarter decisions about when the best time to reinvest in our roads are and to make sure that we're getting the most out of our in initial investment. So one recommendation we want you to consider is that we shift our investment from the trail gap fund, which um, would have been $250,000 in 2024 um, and shift that over to the street fund now, um, this could be for a period of time, but we would um, recommend at least for 2024. Um, by eliminating the trail fund transfer and redirecting those funds to the street maintenance, we can minimize a levy increase that would be needed in order to fund some of that cost sharing that we will have um, coming up in this next couple years. So. Additionally, the plans for the new roads um, will include trail connections. So we're still making trail connections, but we're leveraging opportunities um, through those street projects. So all the other transfers are pretty much in line with what we've done in the past. Um, facilities fund is just increasing slightly. Um, part of that is still for the um, designing for the new fire station piece, and then um, public works um, equipment and fire equipment are going up um, slightly. Um, and those would be for the equipment that we, we buy for those departments. Um, concerts in the park fund, we typically transfer 10,000 a year in order to pay for concerts. Um, we do get some donations for those, but it doesn't cover the cost of all the concerts that we provide down there. So back, oh, sorry. Go ahead. The facilities fund, so we're, it's less of a transfer because of the, we, we've paid for the fire station planning, so. So we had a two year plan, so we did transfer we had $150,000 for this year for design and then $250,000 for 2024 design. So part of the rest of that transfer from the previous years was for facility projects that we had for the offices and um, the out at the um, fire station. 
So some of the so the fifty thousand dollars that we transferred this year, and we need eight hundred and fifty thousand for next year. And so part of that's going to come from the trails funds, part of that from the park fund, probably part of it from the long-term street maintenance, and part of it from bonding. Is that what we're thinking? Yeah. So originally the long-term street maintenance fund we had in there six hundred thousand dollar transfer for twenty twenty-four. So the eight fifty includes the 250 that we were going to transfer from into the trail fund. So the reason why it was only 50,000 for 2023 was because we originally had um, a, we had surplus funds from 2021 that we had carried over and reduced the levy um, for the subsequent years in order to lower the levy and that's why that 50,000 was so low. But it originally was, I think, about a half a million. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're going to shift to ARPA, uh, American Rescue Plan funds, um, was passed by the president in 2021 to address the negative economic impacts caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. This money can be used to replace lost public sector revenues, provide premium pay for essential workers, or to invest in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. So the amount of money that we received was $1.1 million, and the following expenses were already approved by council. So these purchases listed here were made in 2022, um, and they include the COVID-19 tests, um, water meter replacements um, have been completed and about 800 meters have been replaced. So we're now running on one meter reading system. This has been a huge operational efficiency gain since we're no longer running two systems and it's going so smoothly. Um, the SCBA washer for our fire department allows for sanita sanitation for their equipment. Um, 200,000 was used for the water treatment plant fire mezzanine construction project. Um, that was the amount that was over budget for that project. So it was not budgeted funds. So um, a council had approved to use some of these funds in order to complete that project. And then we also had included some water treatment plant security upgrades um, that were done to the building. So that lead left us with a balance at the end of 2022 of $689,000. So what do we have planned to spend? So many of the projects that we have planned for this year and have received quotes on are related to the SCADA upgrade. So that was one of the original projects that we had brought to council and um, were approved to make to our water treatment plant. Many of the items have already um, been before you and been approved and a few have been completed and many of them are still underway. So the lift station, well and water treatment control upgrades and the booster station security have been approved by council. So those um, few items, the Rhapsody booster station for 25,000, the lift station 15 and 18 control upgrades and then the well three and four control upgrades and the water treatment plant control upgrades. So those top items there. Um, we also um, are, have purchased hydrant pressure monitors. Um, so those will help the public works to be able to, they can move them around to different hydrants. They can measure the pressures. They can know like where we're losing um, where the pressure is going down and they can detect problems and it's um, something that's really gonna help them, especially for planning for future needs too. Um, the Lexa pole on the bottom there for 10,000, that is a fire department training and policies. Um, well, it's a subscription software, so it helps for um, Andrew is able to 
have all of the policies updated and to make sure that he's keeping up with all of the necessary things that police or fire chiefs have to keep up with and make sure that their training is being tracked and that they're um, they're doing all of their required trainings. So um, that has already been purchased. The water treatment office lab renovations will be going to bid and I believe their bid opening is tomorrow. And we're still considering the security um, and the quotes that we receive for the influent effluent meters for the water treatment plant and security for well water treatment plant well three and the water tower. So there's still some security things that we'd like to get done. They have not been brought to council yet, but they will be once we get um, all of the quotes, necessary quotes and bids in place. So with all of those items, um, and some of it is estimated and some of it is quoted and some of it is actual, our estimated 2023 total would be $390,000. And all of these projects do qualify for the federal ARPA um, spending and have not been included in any of our budgets. So we estimate having about $299,000 left. So here's what we're considering um, for that. So the federal government's mandated some strict lead and copper rules, which could be very costly for the city to comply with. So um, this could likely end up being an unfunded mandate. So it's something that we're monitoring closely and we're researching some options for us to have those requirements met and what those costs could be um, associated with that process. So I listed that there um, as one of the possible spends for this money. Um, there's also one more upgrade for our SCADA that we feel at the booster station um, would be a good project. And we're looking to get some quotes for that. And then connecting cellular to the lift stations would be another project that we could consider. Right now we're communicating through radio and there's a lot of interruptions to the radio wave. So with cellular, we could eliminate false alarms by having a backup communication system um, until we're able to get fiber through all of those locations. Um, and then that leads me to the fire, fiber projects, um, which we're limited in doing based on MetroNet and CenturyLink projects, but um, just kind of listed it out there um, in case something comes up or we'd have the opportunity to expand. Um, it would be a good project to use these funds for. And then any money that we would maybe have left over um, that we need to spend before the deadline of December 2024, um, we would put spend on unplanned street projects. So um, that's kind of the list that we've compiled. It's um, They would all be good projects, we felt, for that use of those funds. Um, and then that just leads me to um, council discussion. And the first item um, is asking if council supports staff's recommendation to redirect the general fund transfer from the trail gap to the long-term street maintenance fund through 2024. All right. So first item up, up for bids here at the on the. Uh, 2024 budget is this recommendation to transfer from the trail gap. So council discussion. How much money would that leave in the trail gap fund? So I'm anticipating around $600,000 at the year end 2023. If we don't do the transfer in 2024, then it would just so there are we wouldn't have any projects coming out in 2024 either so okay so we would still have a balance and mm -hmm. and you know we have been super super fortunate to get this highway 5 and this county road 18 projects on the calendar and we need to figure out how to pay for those so i guess um i for one would be in favor of transferring the trail gap to the long-term street maintenance council other 
just ask, have we done any, have we actually, we actually completed a project out of the trail gap fund? So we are completing the Greencrest sidewalk and then that portion of Bavaria trail this year and that's coming out of that fund. It's 28, so one project since 2018? I mean, there was, yes, because we did that study for that one, that the other Bavaria piece that we weren't able to complete. Trish, could I ask a favor? Could you back up to the slide where you had the, the 850 number for the, right? So this long-term street maintenance, I just want to get clear on understanding. If, if I understood what you said, that this 50,000 that was in there is seemingly artificially low, right? It, it should really be something closer to a half a million dollars. That's correct. The reason why it was lowered was because of that surplus that we had from prior year. Okay, so we, what we're seeing is a lumpiness, and, and realistically, then this 850 should probably be slid a little bit closer to 600 when we take out this trail gap number that you boosted it up to 850. Right. Exactly, yeah. So it originally was 600,000 in the long term financial plan. Got it. So if we were to wipe out the lumpiness, we're not that far off of where we would ordinarily be here, correct? Correct. And so this, this shift that we were talking about really isn't as massive as this bar graph would otherwise portend, correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. So mm -hmm. if, if, we don't, if you don't mind, just bring us back to your... All right, so... Oh. I, I think I'm with you, Mary McMillan, that I don't find this to be objectionable to be able to move this trail gap funding into the street repairs. I mean, we've needed to get ahead of this for a, a long time. I mean, I think as long as Trish and I have known one another here at the city, we've always gone back and forth around this stuff. And so uh, to the extent that we can make some headway on it, feels like that's being good stewards of the resources that we're being asked to manage. My only question, I, I'm, I agree, is main, street maintenance or gap connections, but how many times have we rated it in the budget process? And how many rated times? Rated the trail gap fund, and how many times are we going to do it? I mean, that's basically what we're doing, we're taking it from one to put it in the mm -hmm. other, and then we have we've done one project out of it in six years. And so how long, I mean, it does, it, it does that gap, fund, does this trail gap fund just go away? So that getting repurposed that for other long-term street maintenance funds. It was nice to have, we tried it. Um, it it's not, doesn't seem to be working out the way that I, the finance committee, when it was, when, when, when we went through that process, talked about it and, and helped the, that council establish it, had a much better, much grander vision of actually create a, creating the trail gaps, uh, finishing the trail gaps, than what we're actually doing now. And right now we're on pace for one every 10 years again. So mm -hmm. uh, does it just go away that, and that money just go to these other funds if we have to continue to rate it instead of having this fund just sit there with the money in it and then we gotta make this transfer? Yeah. Good, good conversation, Ms. Hardy, please. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the council, I just want to say we're not necessarily rating that fund. So the fund balance, just I just want to make sure we're all saying we're all on the same page. So the fund balance remains untouched. So the money that's in there right now, we would keep in there. What we're talking about is the general fund transfer. So you've had, I'll call it a semi-long standing process where every year, um, when you take in your property tax dollars and you make these general fund transfers that you've said at by policy you want to transfer some into streets some into parks you're going to transfer some of those property tax dollars also into this trail gap fund that's what we're talking about here that transfer so it just different different from the fund balance the fund balance would stay there and part of that um, rationale it, you're you're absolutely correct these projects are complicated um, in for the they're expensive um, 
And part of the discussion in our Park and Rec Committee has worked really hard over the last several, several years to prioritize and really look at where those opportunities might be to complete those trail gaps. Um, and the ones that remain today are those complicated, really expensive ones, oftentimes requiring right-of-way acquisition. So even if you wanted to do some, say this is a number one priority for you, there are still hurdles, if, even if you had the fun that funds to do it, you might still have some hurdles where you're not able to do that because you may not have a willing property owner um, to get that access to those easements. So um, with this opportunity, and that was something that the Park and Rec Committee had always talked about too, that as opportunities arise, so if there are other street projects that are happening or an opportunity where, for us to make other trail connections, maybe it's not our number one priority, maybe it's our number 10 priority, but because that opportunity through a reconstruction project came um, or funding resources are there that makes that possible, that maybe we shift those things up and consider. And that's what we're proposing here, that we, through these street projects, now that we're really doing something with Highway 5, um, it's not that we're not going to make a trail connection. Um, there's still those pedestrian connections that are happening through these projects. So we thought that this would be a good time since we don't have anything in the works or plan for 2024 that you could still make a trail connection and that pedestrian connection using trail funds by making that shift or that redirect of that general fund transfer. So hopefully that just clarifies things a little bit more. The question still is there is the money that's sitting in that fund better used is the highest and best use for it to sit there in that fund for another 12 years before we do another project? Or is it better used to streets and buying salt for the snow in 2023? Uh, so, I mean, that, those are the things that I think need to be addressed. That fund doesn't seem to be effective. It's, it's, the money can be better used, high, the highest and best used is not sitting in this trail gap fund. I, I wouldn't be so quick to dispense with that trail gap notion. The, the, we, we dusting off the cobwebs, the Amira project that is projected for the Heaney property does have a contemplation of a trail extension, and the Lake Bridge neighborhood is has expressed an interest of a way to get connected to that trail. And then there's the other end that we've that I think came up about connecting it to the. Uh, area north of um, where, where the old park used to be, where the tr basically the trailhead is. So it, it does seem like those are the kind of things that uh, Dana spoke of, that those connections would be something that is on the horizon, something that would be a little bit on the tricky, troublesome side. And I, it probably makes sense for us to be thinking through that and have access to a way to deal with those um, when that stuff comes online and we, we would be prepared for it rather than asking questions like how did we not see this I, I think that um, hopefully we've got a vision for that and can use this for that sure. yeah we do also I should add have um, in part of the um, street plan there is a portion part of a project that had a trail that we were planning to use trail funds for. So I think it was about half of like maybe 300,000. I'd have to go back and look for sure. So we are gonna plan to use some of that money um, for one of those projects that's next year. So yeah. it won't be sitting there that long. Yeah. It is a good question though, because we do have some of these, you know, directed funds that we've kind of planned for. And, and as we're, you know, taking a look at the cost of doing business for cities and inflation and pressures, budget pressures. I think there's, you know, I think we owe it to our residents to look under all the rocks and make sure that we're we're being good stewards of the money. To Councilmember Ivansky's uh, point. So, but I see consensus on going ahead and doing this for 2024. Yes. All right. I agree. All right. Okay. Okay. So this, um, I know you kind of talked a little bit about the. Hundred thousand dollars that's in the max tax budget for the park master planning. So um, it kind of sounded like you wanted to think a little bit more about this um, rather than maybe make a decision about tonight. But that's basically um, what this 
council discussion is for. Um, other options are delaying it um, until later, like was mentioned, um, or reduce the funding, have a smaller scope, um, or eliminate it all together. So, could we get this out of the trail fund gap? Or trail, trail fund. This hundred thousand dollars, and I think I think my point remains. I really want to understand what the scope of a park master plan would be before I would say, yeah, I think it's a good idea to spend a hundred thousand dollars on it. But you know, uh, to Councilmember Gunderson's point, um, if we if we are looking to have some you know kind of this you know star park in our community, what does that look like? Where does that go? Um, can there be some improvements to Lions Park that might meet some of those needs and, and some of that sort of thing? So I think um, well, it's not just a star park. I mean, it's it's also what, what's our we talk about mixing up a housing stock. This is about yeah. mixing up a park stock, and and what amenities are at these parks and how are we? What is the vision of the city of lakes and parks uh, for their park system? Sure. You know, I mean, right now, all I can think about at the parks we have. We're a plastic park. It's that's what they have. Um, so, just making sure that we're staying on top of it, so that we have some something to go. Does this meet what we originally discussed, and that people came in and talked about in the plan in the planning process? So, yeah. I think the first thing we do is go back and there's information in from twenty two thousand three on how they came up with that plan. Is to say what did they do? How much did they pay for this plan? And how on target was it and how much did it change? Yeah. And then figure out where that fits in with this process. But I, I, like I said, it doesn't have to be $100,000 but in, in, in a budget, but if that's what it's gonna cost, or how do we get it, get that dollar lower to have a master plan? I feel like we kind of need things to gel a little bit before we can um, get an idea here. If, if we're gonna have to increase the tax rate to do this, then maybe we need to take a step back and bring this to the side. But if within the increased and assessed valuations in that tax capacity, if we can get this done and not have to raise that rate, then perhaps we could uh, see if whether this stays or not. But I think that this feels a touch more on the discretionary side at this point, then given we're still going to have pressures of inflation, you know, there's there's some hope that springs out there that um, the rate increases are going to kind of come to an end and the the picture on inflation starts to abate. Um, but but until we can see more clear signs of that, we might want to think about just again, being good stewards here and, and really keep a sharp pencil on this. It might even be nice to talk. We've had a lot of change on the council, right? We've got two new members. I don't know if we've talked completely about it, even, you know, like maybe it's part of our half day workshop or whatever, right? Like where we talk about like what what's our vision now for, because we really haven't had a major discussion, right? It's just been going forward with trail gap stuff. and That would be helpful for me yeah. as well. Yeah. I agree. That's a good point. All right. Thumbs up on that one. Set that aside for now. Okay. Uh, clarification. Sorry. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. So, for the purposes of budgeting, did you want us to leave the hundred thousand in, or would you like to see that come out before max tax? I would. I, I'd leave the number alone. We're not at. We're not at the decision making point. We're at the the workshop stage. That's what we're doing here. So. It, it's in there. We know where we're at. We're on a high end right now. If it comes down, my feeling would be leave that number alone until we've talked about it and get to a point where we bring it down, to where we've had the discussions. Council, does that gel with your thinking? Yeah. yeah. All right. Looks like consensus on that. Leave it in. Thank you for a clarification. You. Last slide. Um, so, is there council direction to add? cut services or increase, reduce the levy. So um, this, again, would come back to like composting, Southwest Transit, those types of services that are um, 
above what we need to do to actually operate the city. So um, are there any ideas from council on items that you would like to see? Or is there a magic number that you're thinking as far as levy increase, um, things like that? Also, thoughts on that? If you cut the composting service, that cuts 20,000 versus a 10,000 increase. So um, if you cut the composting altogether, it would decrease at $30,000. We cut it all together, it decreases at $30,000. So, so our residents have to figure out how to do their own composting. This will not be a city service. Right. It would save us $30,000. So, I mean, that those are numbers that we, if we're, I mean, cuts to any services we talk about, we need to know what the total cost of what that service is. Yeah, so composting would be 30000 Southwest Transit is also 30000 a year. So t say a little bit more about the Southwest Transit. Um, what is what is the increase kind of year over year over the last few years been on that? Yeah. Um, talk, is everybody familiar with that service that Southwest Transit provides? It's that kind of dial-a-ride service, to Southwest Prime. Right, yeah, you can call, you can schedule a ride. Um, yeah. Southwest Prime is the service. We, we, the city of Victoria taxpayers, subsidizes those rides. Um, is it a flat and rate? It's ten dollars per ride. That so, we, no matter where they're going. Yeah. So, uh, most rides it costs the person riding four dollars a ride. I believe they charge a little bit more to go to the airport, but we still pay ten ten dollars no matter what. So, um, whether you're going to Goodwill in Chaska or you're going to the airport, we pay ten dollars. Okay. Um so I've seen last year, so from twenty two to twenty three we increase it from twenty thousand to thirty thousand dollars because there was a huge increase in ridership, mostly because of airport rides. So I've kind of figured out that we probably spend at least at least three thousand dollars a year just on airport rides alone. So do we have the numbers on like the percentage that are airport versus because to be honest, if you're going to the airport, you're either going on a vacation or you're going for work. If you're going for work, your work should be paying for, right? Yeah. Like I know my work pays for, right? Like, and if you're going on a vacation, you can afford a vacation. You like, that's part of budgeting for, so I'm like, I don't think people should be, we should be subsidizing people going yeah. on vacation or doing work. This is also the same service that had that showed the higher increase in rides at the casino, right? Yeah, so um, Yeah, so we can you can restrict it So what the city of Carver did list last year was they re they took out that Area that goes to like the Mall of America the casino and the airport So they don't provide rides to those places anymore so you could subsidize. Yeah, so subsidize. people can still do it, but it would yeah, but they would they'd yeah, have to pay. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> so I think that's I, I'm looking around. I'm seeing. Do we want to review that service maybe and see if there's some way to cut some? Yeah, we can talk to Southwest Transit and see about um, what that looks like. Being able to reduce that scope of the area where we provide those rides, because um, the. Uh, the increase in the airport rides has every month it gets more and more riders as people learn about yeah, that and, opportunity and, and the kind of the benefit that that is to be able to get a lift down yeah. there. It would be it would be um, interesting to find out how much it would cost folks without our subsidy. So okay. you know, if we'll get paying, that information. If they're paying five bucks and we're paying ten bucks, do they end up paying fifteen bucks for the? Ride to the airport. If so, that's that seems like a pretty reasonable ride to the airport. Right. I mean, I, I'd it'd like be eighty dollars for a taxi. Well, it's going to be cheaper than an Uber. I mean, I'd like to see it right size, but I also want to be able to not cut services for residents of Victoria that have really a bona fide need for it. Oh, you know, if you're elderly and it's difficult for you to like use Uber, for instance, or you have uh, you know you use facing limited living on a fixed income I, I don't want to see that get cut but I would like to see it be you know like councilmember Roberts says councilmember Reed's not subsidizing people who would otherwise ordinarily have a viable outlet to pay for it 
Well, and we, there are, we're still contributing to the WeCab. Yeah, so well. we're still subsidizing through the WeCab the $2,500 annually. Mm -hmm. um, so that provides rides for the elderly. And also reducing the scope of the Southwest Transit would not eliminate, you know, rides to like, we do a lot to Chaska um, and like some medical centers. Um, we have a few of those here and there. Um, it would just basically, from my understanding, take out the airport and the Mall of America and the Mystic Lake Casino. I, I'm honestly more apt to allow people to continue to go to the airport than I am to the mall or the casino. Um, and and those are things that you know, that we that we should not be subsidizing, right? I mean, that's, uh, but if, if you can't take all of them out, then we uh, that's just $30,000 that we're, we're spending for people to go do other that things that just that we shouldn't have to pay for. Yeah, I mean, it's hard, right? Because like Greg said, you know, you, you want to make sure people can, if they need need that ride to get to a grocery store or whatever, that they have that ability. But yeah. But again, would, here's there's a thing. If we cut that and then we let's just, hypothetically increase our, our donation to WeCab and put some more behind that where they can put out the word that we do these services mm -hmm. too for the people that Greg might be referring, Councilman Vansky might be referring to, um, then we've done, then we've cut a budget and not limited resources for people to get to where they need to be. And that's what we're here to do, right? Make sure we're not limiting impacts to services that people are using, but being good stewards of the money. Yeah. So. yeah, I think the big thing is, yeah, finding the, what the cost would go down if we limited it, the scope of where they go. Yeah. Intended use. Yeah. This is a big thing. Yeah. I'll get some more information and report back All right. on that. Um, we have a couple more, a couple yeah. more minutes here. Any other items? You know, from my perspective, our our budget goes up every year just from you know increase in building and increase in um, values. And I know that's very modest this year, but it's always a good idea to see can we wrap our expenditures within that natural increase. Um, so, uh, you know, again, we're stewards of the taxpayer money, so always looking for opportunities to cut the budget, reduce the levy, and, uh, you know, make sure that we're being cognizant of folks um, who are, you know, who are on fixed incomes. We do have those folks, and, and we want to make sure that we're, we are good stewards of this money. So um, always looking for those opportunities as well, where we can kind of save some dollars. Um, council, other things that would be helpful to you in decision making? I think we're in pretty good stead, a little bit chicken and egg, but you know, as, as we get into it, I, I share your view that you know, we sort of have this natural progression in revenue coming in from home value increases, but we also have expenditures that increase and to try to blend the two to get to the least amount of uh, impact is, I think, where we'll all uh, create a win-win situation. So, um, great, thank you, Councilmember Ivansky. Where, where? Councilmember, the question is, what additional information do we need? Where are we at with our goals versus what this budget does for those goals? I guess is what we the, around we strategic should, planning and which is what we should have a hand in hand, side by side. This is the goal we've talked about doing. And this is what this budget is doing for that goal. That's good. Good so. feedback. Great. I had a question about ARPA. Yeah, Councilmember Reich. What was the date that we had to use those monies by? Was it 1224? Yeah, so December of 2024, you need to have it expended. So that means it doesn't have to be out the door, but it has to be like under contract or, you know, we're working on a project where we've committed those funds to be spent, which would then ex extend that deadline to 2026. Yeah. So um, we're pretty confident we, we can. I'm pretty sure we can spend it by the end of 2024, so I'm not too worried about. So that wish list that you had listed, um, obviously we can't do all those things simply because, uh, you know, you mentioned like the restraints with fiber projects. If there's mm -hmm. an opportunity, we should take advantage of it. I would agree with that. This uh, money would not cover this wish list should we be able to do it all. So is there anything on this list 
that council would like to prioritize? Maybe that's the question. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I had a, a potential addition that would maybe push the priority of some of the things we see down. How, how can we, is there a possibility that we can get ahead of uh, some future needs that I think we're going to reasonably foresee in terms of the fire department, like a ladder truck? I mean, that, that seems to be something that might be increasingly popping up as a discussion item. It's going to be pricey. Can, can we get that as an unplanned item that we would be able to move these ARPA dollars in and get ahead of that? Yeah, so that's a great question, um, council member. But part of the problem with, like, let's say the ladder truck specifically, I mean, that's we're looking at like 2026, 2027 for that. So those, these monies would have to be expended before that time. Um, and plus, um, those projects right now, too, um, are taking up to two, three years. Um, some I've heard five years to get a truck now. We've, we've had a truck um, on order for it's two, two years. years. It's um, coming. Yeah. <laughs> I've right. seen pictures, but <laughs> it's real. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's part of the problem with some of those. Um, and also, they are in our long-term plan. We're trying to stay away from spending the money on things that are in our long-term plan that we've already kind of incorporated into our budget um, and to come up with unfunded projects that then we don't need to worry about raising water and sewer rates to, to try and pay for those types of projects. So um, that's kind of where you see a lot of those, um, those water and utility projects are on the plans. I mean, you said the lead and copper rule, that's going to be expensive. I mean, when you say expensive, let's ex is that going to eat up the whole, most of that 300000 or is? Yeah, so I have um, Brady, our utility superintendent, doing some research on that. Um, it's so new yet, um, but initially what they were saying is that we are going to need pictures of every single connection, meaning like everybody's water meter and actual like photograph of all of these which would mean trying to get into people's homes or having them send so I mean there could be a lot of staff time I mean and so we would maybe need to hire somebody that could take care of you know taking care of some of these requirements it's just so new um, that we don't know we do know that there are places out there that are starting to come up with plans to help cities to figure out how to comply. Um, so we're just trying to get some information on that right now. But we don't really know about a dollar amount, but it could be significant. I think that's something that's still kind of emerging. Um, I kind of want to wrap this up because we've got a pretty full agenda tonight for the council meeting. So anything, any last thoughts from council on this for staff. Anything we can tell you quickly, Trish? To no, I think I got a really good um, feel for where you're kind of going with some of these items. So I think we'll just kind of keep communicating and um, talk more about some of those item, larger items, and I'll get you some more information on some things, and we'll. And just to kind of wrap this up, I think I feel like staff has a really good idea too about where there are opportunities within the budget that we might be able to save some dollars. Yeah, absolutely. Like like we said early on, um, this is preliminary, so there are things that will shift um, as we move forward into August um, when we come back with some more refined numbers for max tax and then also we would continue to refine those numbers up until we adopt it in December so this is just the beginning yeah. it's <laughs> so, more fun to come yes more All fun right. to come but it gives me a really good idea where you're kind of landing so All right. very good alright council uh, that is the only item to come before us so I will entertain a motion to adjourn the workshop motion second we have a motion and a second all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. any opposed 
Motion carries. We will be back in about five minutes while we switch over. We're adjourned.